So as technologists, startup entrepreneurs, people that work in tech, how many times has this happened to you? You found somewhere you'd like to sit, you open up your laptop, you drop down your Wi-Fi list, and everything has a padlock. No open Wi-Fi. The one time, perhaps, when we would love someone to actually share something with us, some Wi-Fi, some access to the internet. Fon enables you to do this. It's a service which allows people to share their Wi-Fi with others, either for, uh, a, for a payment or as part of a free and open network that they've created. However, founder and CEO Martin Vasovsky discovered that there were a number of challenges with this. Maybe you're sharing something that you don't necessarily own that you think you own. As a regular to uh, uh, the web, he really needs no further introduction. We're pleased to have him back. Please welcome on stage Martin Vasovsky. Well, it's, uh, I'm very happy to be here, especially following after my daughter and Carolina. That was a very special moment for me. Uh, I was going to talk about the sharing economy, sort of the bad news of the sharing economy, which is that you tend to believe that a lot of things are yours until you want to share them, right? And it is when you want to share them that you realize that they may actually not be yours exactly the way you thought. So Phone has become the largest Wi-Fi network in the world over the last six or seven years, but not without having some of the problems that I'm going to describe with many other companies in the sharing economy, which is that you think it's your Wi-Fi, but it is your Wi-Fi, but there's some terms and conditions that may not allow you to share. And I'm going to talk about how we got over those and all the problems uh, we had to deal with. A very well-known one is your music. Everybody thinks they own their music, they have their music, but then it turns out that a lot of your music is not really yours, even when you buy it on iTunes or companies like SoundCloud or, or Spotify have a great deal of issues. Uh, now there's Google Music, there's, there's Amazon Music, but there's always this tension between what is really yours and what is not yours. Uh, your books, that a, that's a, used to be a given, because if you, if you think your books are yours, and there's a long history of libraries, right? And so libraries buy a book, and they share a book. So you would imagine that sharing a book is perfectly acceptable. But then there's, there's startups like Buka Buka who have started sharing uh, books and sharing textbooks, and they run into a lot of issues where it was even called a pirate pay for textbooks. Um, your money, okay, now this one, you would tend to think your money is yours, right? But then what happens many times is that you, you would like to engage in activities related to your money, for example, lending your money directly, lending your money directly, or you would like to crowdfund, well, it turns out that a lot of things that you... It turns out that the governments of the world are out there protecting you from a lot of things you could do with your own money, including investing in the startups in this room. So um, you are not authorized to, to advertise for people to invest in your startup, for example, because the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States regulates these and other regulatory agencies regulate these. Interestingly, this is an area that is more regulated in the United States than in Europe. In Europe, it is legal for companies to go public and advertise their shares on television, for example, something that is not, is not actually legal in the United States. But there's a, a list of companies that have had and faced problems with regulators, problems problems that deal with laws that have been designed to protect you from making a foolish use of your own money. And that, that, is, uh, that is something that has made these companies not being able to grow as well as they could. In terms of videos, uh, you may wonder, you know, when, when uh, Chad Hurley and Steven, when they sold, when they sold YouTube to, to Google, um, 
there's theories as to why they did it. You could say they did it because a billion dollars looked good and they, they decided to sell. But I would venture to say that a, lo a lot of the reasons why YouTube was sold to Google was because sharing videos was also a highly regulated activity. And your excitement after watching an episode of something you liked and put it in a little clip, I feel that the YouTube founders needed a tremendous, needed the legal army of Google to protect themselves in order to negotiate. And this is an area in which there's constantly issues. For example, Netflix continues to gain and lose inventories and other video companies, but there's also issues with your own videos. Sometimes you, you, you film your child, but there's Maroon 5 in the background, and they say, well, this is actually a video to promote Maroon 5 and not your child, and they say this music is subject to copyright law, or I have found myself using Vimeo more than YouTube many times because I, I feel that Vimeo is a little more lax on whether I have a, a video which I consider a family video with some music on the background, but YouTube, which is highly watched, cannot many times, so you're trying to share your family memories, you're trying to shoot a scene where there was music playing, and you had the rights to that music, and the music was playing in your living room, and you still can't share it on YouTube because of the implication, not of the images of, you, of your children or your family, but the music that was, playing, uh, that was playing there. And then there's, there's uh, your table, and things as, as simple as inviting people to eat at your home or cooking at your home. You would tend to think that inviting people over, cooking at your home, but it turns out that there are a lot of legal issues that concern with simple things such as uh, having people pay to eat at your home as if it was a restaurant. Um, this is a big one on your research. There is a tremendous, I'm talking about scientific research. You would tend to believe that if you are a scientist, you own your scientific findings, you own your, or you share them maybe with your university. But it turns out that when you publish on Nature, when you publish on many journals, and this is not a new issue, but it's been an issue, that when you want to share your ideas with the world, there's one issue, of course, which is patent or publish. But even if you just publish, the, you cannot manage the future publication of what you had published once you've given the right. And this is an issue that re that's been historical, but it has been exacerbated by the fact that the fact that universities are still buying journals and scientists who are not associated with universities uh, suffer because they don't have access to these journals. You probably all heard about the tragic death of Aaron Schwartz and the whole concept of information wants to be free and however you may feel about scientific journals, I think we can all empathize that there's information, and especially scientific information, does want to be free, but he was highly prosecuted for trying to share scientific information to the point that he may have been driven to suicide over that. So this is a pretty sad and significant issue. And then such menial things like sharing household tasks, there's many companies that are doing these, but then you say, well, does somebody, if you start sharing household tasks or if you hire a neighbor, when, when is the limit as to when does hiring somebody from your neighborhood become employment and all the laws that regulate employment? And, and what, if, what if you, in some countries, there's issues of taxation, like when you receive when you're sharing services in some countries, for example, Germany is pretty tough on this one. In, in Germany, there's a tremendous tendency to consider any kind of free service that you may receive as income, as income, and it, ma it makes it hard to, to share. Uh, well, this is a big one, sharing cars and everything relating to cars. It is extremely complicated, the regulation. You would say, well, I own my car. I can take anyone I want in my car. 
But when you do that, you run into a lot, a lot of regulations that relate to the insurance in your car, who's allowed to drive your car, who may come and, and uh, what if you charge? If you charge for these, there is, a, there is a significant monopoly that has been granted to fleet operators. For example, in New York City, they are sold medallions that sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, these, they, and operators believe that they have a monopoly right or some kind of monopoly right. The taxis believe they have a monopoly right. And these medallions are sold for in a market. And actually, the people who drive the cars most of the time are not the owners of the medallions. So this is a sector that is overprotected. This is a sector that is ready for change. But when companies try to change this, companies like Uber, or more concretely, Lyft. Lyft is more part of the sharing economy in the sense that it's a regular person who's, in essence, acting like a taxi driver. But it's a donation system because it tries to avoid, avoid the whole regulation that relates to, to uh, driving a car for money. And, and I understand that all these laws were made to protect people because it's interesting. All these laws were made to protect people from unscrupulous operators. But I think the sharing economy has proven that there's a lot of nice people around the world and that there's a lot of people who would like to share, and there's a lot of people who would like to make some money sharing, but they also see another value in sharing, which is getting to know people, getting to relate to people, and that there is a contrast between the consumer, the pure consumerism and the sharing economy, and that is something that has to be acknowledged by insurance companies and by all the other players that exist in the environment. Now, the, another gigantic problem comes when you want to share your house. And I think most people truly believe that their house is theirs, right? I mean, that, that, there's no doubt about that. And you should be able to share your house, to rent your house, especially if you're not a tenant yourself. If you're the outright owner of your house, why wouldn't you be able to rent it? If, you can, if you're allowed to rent it by the month, if you're allowed to rent it by the year, why shouldn't you be allowed to rent it by the week? Which is, let's say, what Airbnb and all these other companies do. But as you know, Airbnb has been running into a lot of problems in Berlin, in New York, in Amsterdam. Why? Because homeowners are not organized. They're not well organized. They're not as well organized as hotel owners. Hotel owners are organized in associations, and they also pay a lot of taxes to the city. So the cities tend to side with hotel owners because the hotel owners are organized to collect taxes and pay them to the city. And there is a significant issue with renting your home um, that hasn't stopped Airbnb. I wanted to touch also on open source. Open source is an amazing movement in which people share for free their uh, software and their software production and the, and the making of programs. But open source runs frequently into patent problems. I mean, what happens is people are working in open source, and then a company that owns a patent comes into the picture and says, you cannot even do this sharing that's going on for free. And that an open source is huge. All these services are huge. But I'm trying to focus on the paradox that sometimes not even your work is yours. Somebody discovers that your work somehow infringed on the work of someone else. And you run into the patent issue. So the problems with sharing are clear and self-evident. But now I'd like to speak about the solutions for the problems of sharing. And I'd like to end this presentation with two cases or two strategies for all of you who are working in the sharing economy. I only see two, way out, two ways out of your problem. 
The first way out I'm going to explain is the one we undertook at Phone. Phone now has 8 million hotspots, growing to 12 million hotspots this year. We're active in, in Europe, of course. We're active in, in Latin America, in, in Africa, in, in Asia. We have tested all the, all the legal systems of the world. And you would say, well, why are you, how come Phone is so successful, considering that the terms and conditions many times say you, sh you cannot share your Wi-Fi? And here comes one of the two strategies to fight the problems with sharing. And that is that you can convince the people who are blocking you that sharing is good for them, that actually their terms and conditions are hurting them. And that's why Fon so successfully was able to convince companies like British Telecom to share their terms and conditions, become our partner, a wonderful partner, as you see all over the UK here, you see BT with uh, Wi-Fi with phone. They're, they're, and they became even our shareholder. So you could say, well, how, can you, how did you manage to turn the people who had these terms and conditions that wouldn't allow to share into your partner and shareholder? And the same with Deutsche Telekom, and the same with MTS of Russia. And we're partners with SoftBank in Japan. With, we were able to do this practically all over the world, OI in Brazil, how did we turn our enemy, quote unquote, into a partner? Well, it turns out that sharing is many times accretive, that sharing is a proposition that can increase value. And that is something that people always ask me, how did you get away with having fun everywhere? How did you convince the regulators to change the laws everywhere? And I'm like, I never, I didn't convince the regulators. I convinced the telcos. How? We showed them that sharing Wi-Fi makes happier customers. When customers pay at home and roam the world for free, they're more likely to pay at home. They're less likely to churn. They're less likely to disappear as customers because there's a lot of substitution of mobile for fixed, and we have stopped the trend. We have made fixed more useful. But in terms of mobile, what we do at phone, is we reduce capex. We reduce capex because a lot of the offloading that goes over Wi-Fi, people pay for mobile but use Wi-Fi. In fact, they might, we are now sending over half of the iPhone traffic of Japan is going through phone. So one strategy is to talk to the people who would normally block you and explain to them how your company, which looks bad on paper, is actually great for them. And that's how we succeeded at Phone. Lastly, I'm going to talk about what about the situation in which you cannot do that? What, in what about the situation, let's say, of Airbnb? trying to convince the hotels of New York City, Amsterdam, and Berlin that people sharing homes is a great thing for hotels. Well, that is a hard case to make. But politicians, and here enter the picture politicians, the second strategy is if you cannot convince your potential enemies or the people who are blocking you into becoming your friends and your partners like we did at phone you have to convince the average person the, the citizens of the country that a certain group of laws that were made to protect them actually are hurting them so the second thing that the sharing economy companies can do is they can become almost political organizers they can talk straight to, straight to the people, so the people talk to the politicians, and the politicians change, or the lawmakers change the rules in which society operates and make it easier to share. Now, the good news, to end in a very positive note, is that most of the problems with sharing are being overcome, either by alliances with the companies that used to be enemies, who see the value as it happened in the case of Fon, or by going straight to the people and explaining to the people the benefits 
very much like, for example, free trade is an activity which tends to hurt some individuals but tends to benefit the society as a whole. Sharing is an activity which sometimes hurts a few companies but tends to help society as a whole. Thank you very much. Mm.